Hi, this is Brian Panish. Remember, sharing is caring. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Get into the game. Hello, hi. We're joined today by Ricardo Echevarria, one of the top trialers in America. Ricardo is a member of the firm of Chernoff, Bedard, and Echevarria. He's a graduate of the Cal Poly University, San Luis Obispo, and the Santa Clara Law School. Ricardo's past president of the Consumer Attorneys of Los Angeles and recipient of the Consumer Attorneys Trial Lawyer of the, Trial Lawyer of the Year. Ricardo, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Brian? I'm doing okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, Ricardo? What led you to be an attorney? Well, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm in Chino, milking cows and feeding calves and doing all that kind of stuff that farmer boys do. And when I, uh, when I, it wasn't until I got into college that I was working with a lot of people who were, you know, deciding to go to law school and it, it just intrigued me. And so I talked to the only lawyer that I knew who's been my mentor my whole career, uh, Mike Bedart, and I asked him what it was like and it interested me more. And I thought, well, it can never take away a law degree from you. So I decided to go to law school and I graduated from college. And then I got lucky to find this law firm. It's the only place I've ever worked. And it's just been great ever since. Now, Ricardo, your firm is known as a, a pioneers in the area of insurance bad faith. And I know that's what you do. But you also try many personal injury and wrongful death cases. Give us an idea and the listeners an idea of the type of practice you're in. Yeah, I would say in more recent years, it's probably 60% suing insurance companies when they don't pay claims. And then more and more now, I'm doing like about 40% is catastrophic injury cases, whether it be paraplegic, quadriplegic, brain injuries, uh, wrongful death cases. And a lot of times there's a mix between both of them because I may handle the personal injury case but then there's insurance issues that go with it in terms of whether you have an open policy. And so I'll chase the insurance company down in a second case to get them paid. Well, let's talk about that first thing in California. When we talk about an open policy, let me just give you a little scenario. What happens is let's say somebody has an insurance policy of 15,000 or hundred thousand, a lawyer writes a letter and says, pay that money the insurance company doesn't pay within the time prescribed by the lawyer. And the lawyers want to all of a sudden say, it's an open policy, meaning unlimited amount of money, whatever you can recover, the insurance company has to pay. It isn't that easy, is it? It isn't that easy because there's got to be certain conditions at the time that that demand is made. You have to establish that the liability of the insured is reasonably clear and then also that the damages are likely to be more than the amount of the demand. So we see cases all the time where, you know, maybe it's a moderate injury and it's a million dollar policy and they demand the million dollar policy. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean the policy is open because you haven't necessarily established that the damages are likely to exceed the amount of the demand. Now, the flip side is also true. There's some cases where, you know, a person is catastrophically injured and the liability is clear. The insured ran a stop sign, caused the accident, and it's only a $15,000 policy. You make that demand, the carrier is going to have a tough time not paying it because they can't say, well, we don't have all the medical records. I mean, you know it's catastrophic. You know the liability is clear and the damages are going to be well in excess of a minimal policy. So do you have to then, once you get the, let's say they offered, they didn't offer the 100000 you got the $2 million verdict. What do you do then? Do you just file a lawsuit against the insurance company or are there certain things that have to be undertaken? Well, you're going to need to get what's called an assignment of rights from the insured because the right to go after that excess judgment over and above the policy limit belongs with the insured, the, the, the defendant. So either that defendant's got to pursue that claim and then assign proceeds or they got to assign the rights to go after it. And it happens all the time, um, but but yeah, you need to have that step in between, and then you have to sue the insurance company to get paid. Now, handling insurance bad faith claims, <laughs> how is it that you put together the damages, and let's exclude punitive damages, Yeah. how is it that you put together the compensatory damages, and what role do punitive damages play in either a settlement or trial? Well, 
uh, first of all, punitive damages are always a leverage point in the litigation. Uh, rare is it the case that an insurance company is going to pay money for punitive damage. In fact, they never do. They'll never admit to it. But it is your leverage uh, to get the claim paid. So at trial, at least, you have the compensatory damage. That's the contract benefits, whatever they may be. If you have like a lot of these wildfire victims, they got you know amounts they haven't been paid under the contract. That is compensatory damages. Punitive damages is where you prove, you have to first prove it, that the insurance company's conduct was malicious, oppressive, or fraudulent. So it's a lot more than just proving that their conduct was unreasonable. You got to prove malice, oppression, or fraud. And by clear and convincing evidence, and then the punitive damages is designed to punish or make an example of the defendant. It is not to compensate the plaintiff. It is to punish uh, wrongful conduct. In California, let's say that I had a home in Malibu on the beach that was burned down in the last fire, yeah. and I just happened to not be there. Yeah. But I, I have a problem with my insurance company. Yeah. They don't want to pay. They're not doing the things that I think are necessary. <laughs> Am I allowed to recover emotional distress for my uh, distress and uneasiness and anxiety as the way the insurance company has treated me? Yes, you are. You know, in California, um, in the context of insurance, it is the only context where you can sue what we call for a tortious breach of contract. In most breach of contracts, all you can recover are the benefits. But in insurance policies, you can recover not just the benefits, but tort damages. That could include, like in your example, emotional distress, uh, but it can also include what we call consequential economic damages. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times we represent small businesses who uh, have insurance bad faith claims uh, dealing with their insurance company, but in dealing with that, they lose other business opportunities. So those consequential damages are also recoverable. And then we just talked about punitive damages as well. It's the only context in California where that's allowed. What, what are your favorite kind of cases in the insurance bad faith arena to handle? Well, um, the most dynamic ones are the health insurance cases because you are dealing not just about money, but you're dealing with health. So you got cancer patients who need treatment and have a window of opportunity to get that treatment and the HMO or the uh, medical insurers uh, are delaying it. They're not approving it. And then the person gets sicker. Those are the kind of cases that really, really will anger a jury because now their conduct is not only costing money, it's, it's affecting the health of the client. Now, I remember a case, I think it was a 1999, your partner and mentor, Michael Bedard tried, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was a law enforcement officer or district attorney, district attorney. Had, who had to, was trying to get some experimental treatments yeah. that the insurance company wasn't allowing and he came up with a creative way to create some damages and to get use that as a leverage point for yeah. punitives. Tell us a little bit about that and how you do that in one of these cases. So, so that was a case for a guy named David Goodrich. David Goodrich was a district attorney and he was diagnosed with a very rare form of stomach cancer called leiomyosarcoma. And he was you know, following the advice of his oncologist and there was a particular treatment that his doctors were recommending. And it was basically almost like a 22 step process to try to get it approved. And by the time he got through that process, there was such a delay of like four to five months, the cancer had then metastasized and he was no longer a candidate for that treatment. So Mike Bedard, who tried the case was able to prove that had they given him the treatment timely, that it would have prolonged his life for about, I think, two or three years and would have given him a better quality of life. Well, against that fact pattern, the jury awarded, I, I want to say it was like three or four million dollars for compensatory damages to the widow for wrongful death, for shortening his life, and 120 million dollars in punitive damages uh, to punish the insurance company because that was Aetna at the time. And the roadblocks that they put up to getting the care were just, were terrible. And the jury saw right through it. 
Well, you just, uh, within the last year, had a tremendous verdict in Fresno. <laughs> that was a combination malpractice, fraud, et cetera. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So I was representing the family of a gentleman named Silvino Perez, who was 70 years old. And he went into the hospital kind of short of breath. And they, they brought him in and they determined he needed to have open heart surgery. And it was to repair an aortic valve and to repair a, a, an aneurysm, aortic aneurysm. It wasn't, you know, life-threatening per se, but it was a matter that was urgent, not emergent. So they admitted him into the hospital, and the doctor who was going to do the open heart surgery, who didn't do the workup, was a guy by the name of Pervez Chaudhry, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon in Fresno, very powerful very wealthy, um, and he was by far the busiest cardiothoracic surgeon in the county. He did done like 700 and some odd surgeries over two years. And so he did the surgery, which by all accounts went well, but then at the conclusion of the surgery, he left not only the operating room, he left the hospital, allowing his physician assistant to close my client's chest and of course, um, he was headed across town to a business meeting and he got a phone call. And one of the common complications after open heart surgery is bleeding because they have to thin out your blood to be able to run it through the heart and lung machine. And, and so when they get done with the surgery, they have to thicken your blood back up. Well, he was having, um, Silvina was having a normal complication excessive bleeding, and, and they called the doctor, and he ordered blood products over the phone, but he didn't come back to the OR. Patient's still in the operating room. He just had his chest freshly closed. They're calling him about bleeding, and he orders blood products. Well, worse yet, 15 minutes later, he gets a second phone call, and now they're talking about even more bleeding, and instead of coming back, he orders more blood products over the phone and keeps driving to his meeting. 20 minutes later, he gets another phone call, and guess what? Silvino Perez went into cardiac arrest and the doctor was a half hour away. You know, they always say, if you're going to have a heart attack, the best place to do it is in the open heart surgery room because they can immediately put you on the heart and lung machine. The problem is that the cardiothoracic surgeon wasn't there. He didn't designate a backup to be there. And now you got this physician assistant and the assistant surgeon trying their desperate best to get them back on the heart and lung machine. They can't do it. 31 minutes later, the doctor gets back into the operating room, puts them on the heart and lung machine within you know, 30 seconds, and does another four hours of repair surgery and ultimately saved his life. So today, Silvino Perez has a beating heart, perfectly beating heart, but he lost so much blood to his brain in that 31 minute window that he's completely in a vegetative state. He cannot talk, he cannot uh, do anything, uh, cannot breathe without a tube, cannot eat without a tube. And so that was the case. And so when we got into it, we realized that not only did he do it in this case, but he had done it in a lot of other cases. And the physician assistant herself said that probably 40, 50% of the time he would leave the operating room for her to close the chest. And really, you know, while that sounds terrible, she is allowed to close the chest so long as he's there supervising her. Because the biggest problem, the biggest evil in that case was not letting somebody else close a chest. The biggest evil was leaving the hospital with no backup cardiothoracic surgeon. And the rule, the rule that he had to follow was simple. You stay with the patient until the patient is stable in the ICU. Patient never made it to the ICU, was in the operating room the whole time. And, you know, of course, the argument's back, well, well, we can't stay there forever. Well, no, you don't have to. You can get a backup, but somebody's got to be there till the patient's um, stable in the ICU. So that jury ended up awarding, you know, we had the life care plan was basically about five and a half million dollars to keep Silvino Perez in the nursing home that he's in. They awarded that, but then for non-economic damages for Silvino Perez, they awarded 25 million. And for his wife of 47 years, they awarded $25 million in loss of consortium damages. And the jury found that this doctor acted not just negligently, but with malice, oppression, and fraud, and awarded another $12.3 million in punitive damages for a total of $68 million. 
Now, was that considered to be under the micro, the malpractice cap, or were you able to subvert that and get the damages opened? So here's what happened. Because of the finding of malice, oppression, and fraud, we had a very strong argument. There's no clear authority on this, but a very strong argument that the MICRA uh, statute should not apply to reduce the damages. Because if you think about it, MICRA was designed to protect doctors who make mistakes. It was not designed to protect doctors who act recklessly and with malice, oppression, or fraud. Now, we briefed that issue. And while the issue was fully briefed before the court ruled upon it, because it's an all or nothing for everybody, all of the cases went to a private mediation and they settled for well above micro limits, but it was definitely you know, creating the leverage with the finding of punitive damages. And like I said, we settled it for the benefit of not just this case. We had five other cases. They all, all settled while that motion was pending. So it never actually got decided. That's fantastic. How long did that trial take? Well, we started, it was about a year ago. It was the week of December 11. I'll never forget. We had six pretrial days. We argued 85 motions in limine. And then we took two weeks off and started jury selection the week of January 8, 2017. And the third verdict, because the case was trifurcated. So we did phase one was uh, the liability. Phase two was the damages and malice, oppression, or fraud. And phase three was the last verdict was on March 20th. So almost wow. three months. Well, that's fantastic. So tell me, tell us about your favorite case you've ever tried. Um, you know, I, I would probably say it's a, probably say it's for Dylan Elkins. Uh, I tried that case back in 2010 and it was a case for a little boy. He was 10 years old. He was kind of a hyper kid and he and his 10 year old buddy, uh, got into the back of a pickup truck with, you know, five 18 year olds in it in a small town called Baker, just outside of about a half hour and a half out of Vegas after a high school football game. And as this truck got on the road, it passed the CHP officer and the 18 year old driver screamed at these kids to jump out of his pickup. Well, the two boys stood up and my client Dylan jumped and became a spastic quadriplegic. Uh, one of the worst injuries you could have, as you know, it, it was a quadriplegia caused not by a spinal cord injury, but by a brain injury. So the problem is he's, he's got these breathing tubes and he's moving around so much, he can knock them out. So you need constant supervision. And there was a $300,000 insurance policy on this 18 year old kid. And of course, all these 18 year olds, when they were interviewed by the cops in the report said, Oh, these kids must've snuck back there. We didn't know they were back there. And right. you know, they all, they're all lying. And I got them all to admit that they lied to the cops but they were telling the truth under oath and everyone believed that you could see right through it. Right. So the, the, we did a $300,000, the referring lawyer did a policy limit demand and the insurance company said, well, look at the police report. All the, this, the, this kid say they all snuck back there. So there's no liability and they refused to pay. Well, the case went to verdict and we got $32 million. But what I love about that case more than anything else is we got, we didn't get all of it paid, but we had a huge chunk of it paid and it changed the family uh, for that kid for life. They were living, this mom was living in a little tiny, probably 120, 130 square foot shack in Baker. And uh, now the whole family moved to Alabama. They got all the amenities. I got a photograph. He's doing great. And, uh, you know, we really did change that family's life and that boy's life. Well, I know you do that quite often. For, for lawyers that are, or law students, that they, they think they want to be a trial lawyer. What, what advice do you have for them? Well, it's not a nine to five job. It is a passion. If you're going to do it right, anybody I know, like you especially, in order to be successful as a trial lawyer, you have to be committed. You can't do it nine to five. It's going to take weekends. It's going to take late nights. It's going to take early mornings. There's, there's no other way to do it. I mean, when you're preparing for trial, it's, that's all you're doing. You're spending all day preparing. You got to, you know, get ready. And that's just the way it's going to be. So you can't delude yourself to think you're going to work nine to five and have that success. It ain't going to happen. What, what type of preparation can you do if you want to be a trial lawyer? Well, I think, uh, the, you know, I always say the litmus test of a good trial lawyer is how good of a storyteller you are and, and, and to, 
figure that out and say, are, are you a good joke teller? And so I think it's good for people to talk to other people, not lawyers, about their case. How do you take a fact pattern and make it a compelling, persuasive story? Tell the story to ordinary people. And I mean, that's what I do when I'm preparing for trial. I talk to everybody. I talk to the, you know, the, the gal at the gym that's you know, checking you in. I talk to the gas station attendant. I talk to anybody who will listen because those are, those are the people that are going to be hearing your case. I know you served as the president of the consumer attorneys. You've been involved in other trial lawyer organizations. Why do you do that? And is that important for young lawyers that want to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I decided to be run for, at the time, secretary of consumer attorneys. And then it's a six-year process to become president. The year after I won trial lawyer of the year, because I realized I never would have won trial lawyer of the year if I wasn't mentored by so many lawyers I met through the organization, yourself included. I saw so many lawyers that I looked up to that I would watch and try to emulate and learn from. And I, I became better as a result. And so I hit that point in my career where I just won that award. And I thought, you know, I need to give back to the organization that gave so much to me. And I tell any young lawyer, absolutely get involved in the consumer attorneys of Los Angeles, consumer attorneys of California, because you're going to network with some of the best lawyers in the best lawyers in the state. And, uh, and it can only help you be a better trial lawyer. And, and it's been, you know, great for me. And it was really an honor to serve as president last year. Well, when, do you go to seminars? Do you listen to speakers? Is that important? All the time, all the time. I, I loved going to seminars. I always pick something up. I learn no matter how many times I've been, I always learn something new. And I tell young lawyers, I said, that's why they call it practicing law, because you're always getting better. You're never going to be at the very top. You're always going to keep climbing and getting better. And so, yeah, I, I love going. I listen. And sometimes you get to speak as well. So it's, it's a very positive experience. And you like hanging out with lawyers, right? Yeah, I like the drink. Not a bad thing. <laughs> Okay, Ricardo, we're, we're lucky to have you. I want to just wrap up and ask you some bullet points that you give that you would want to give to someone that wants to start a personal injury practice representing people. Yeah. How would you, what would they need to do and what should they look forward to doing? Well, they, they have to be uh, committed to trying cases. You'll never have a successful personal injury practice unless you have a reputation for trying cases. It's hard to do. And at the beginning, you're going to try some tough cases. You're going to try impossible cases. But the, you know, get in the courtroom, try the cases. And I always say, you try a tough case, it's a win-win for you. If you win the case, they're going to say, how the hell did you win that case? And if you lose the case, they're going to say, this guy's crazy. He'll try anything. But over time, you're going to win more of those cases than you think you will. And, and then, then you start getting better cases. And then you win those cases. And then... It's, you have to develop a foundation, and that foundation is having skills in the courtroom trying cases. Otherwise, it'll never happen. Well, thank you, Ricardo. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks for all you do, and I know that you're going to continue to have great success and change many more people's lives and make a difference in their lives throughout your career. So well, thanks for joining us, and thanks for all you do. All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hi. This is Brian Panish. Remember, sharing is caring. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Get into the game.